And we're back with a RimWorld tutorial. A vanilla RimWorld tutorial. We will not be including royalty, ideology, or biotech, because trying to do all at once would probably drive you insane. We need to get started, as this is an incredibly deep game, and I want to keep this tutorial at under an hour, and my sanity hopefully intact. First up, Crash Landed is the best scenario. Lost Tribes gives you two extra people, however it halves your research speed roughly, so that's terrible. Rich Explorer starts you at one person, Naked Brutality is for when you're just being a masochist. Next up, you get to choose your storyteller. Now, first and foremost, RimWorld is a story generator, not an actual game. I know, I rolled my eyes too first time I heard it, a game is a game. However, the fact that this is a story generator changes things quite significantly. Normally, if you play a game well, you get to succeed and keep going. In this game, if you play well and perfectly, you can still end up dying. That's just the way it is. These storytellers determine how much threats will be thrown at you, uh, things like that. While it will try to moderate itself so as not to completely wipe you out, they don't mind hurting you a bit. They can and will wipe out your entire base if you are unprepared or in play in any way sloppily. And even if you play well, they can still wipe you out just because you get an unlucky confluence of circumstances. Uh, there are only two real main choices. Cassandra Classic. This is your basic standard issue. She ramps up slowly and threats get bigger and bigger as she goes along. Then there's Randy Random, completely random, meaning they can throw way too much at you way too quickly in way too short a period of time, and it's possibly the most fun. And then there's Phoebe Chillax, which basically she doesn't throw anything at you for ages, and eventually when she does, it's been so long since the last threat came that this was too massive and you had no per defenses prepared and you die. By default, most people will go with this their first time around and then switch to Randy from just about every scenario afterwards. You will have to choose your commitment mode, reload any time is recommended for newer players. Custom is where you can set up exactly how everything is tweaked. I would not advise this on a first run through. Next brings us to world generation. We are going to go with the seed simple, capital S. This is where you get to choose how, many, how much stuff goes into the world. Just leave everything at default and hit generate. This is the whole world. If you click on tiles, you can actually make the sun move around it a bit at the start. There will be a 24 hour night cycle and day cycle. There will also be, well, differences in temperature depending on how far or at north or south of the equator you go. What we want to do is find somewhere in a it's almost equatorial region where this growing period is quite long. You see this growing period here is year round. Yet if we go up really far north, you'll notice the growing period is only 30 of 60 days. There's 60 days in a year in RimWorld. All of these different house looking things are basically factions. So the purple one is the one you want to trade with initially, namely because they have decent tech, as in they've got guns, body armor, stuff of around industrial quality. The, uh, the more tribal looking stuff, they've got bows, arrows, spears, and stuff you don't really care about. Then you've got these uh, angry looking ones. They will always be angry with you and angry looking pirates always be angry with you. Don't worry about where you settle. It doesn't affect raids or anything that gets thrown at you. This map is purely for just picking out a location to set up your initial base. Later on, you can change your base if you want, though most people won't do that on a first run. Now, what we want to do is try doing multiple things at the same time, so we are going to settle here. It has the stone-type marble. Now, some people will recommend you should also get granite. Granite is nice because it's very tough, but honestly, for stone-types, marble is probably your best bet. If you can only get one stone-type on a location, pick marble. Every, as you can see here, you can also get limestone, sandstone, slate, there's a whole bunch of others. All we really want though is marble. We're also going to settle in a river so we can take advantage, advantage of it for power. If you try and settle too close to a location, it will warn you that they will start to hate you. You have to settle more than four tiles away, otherwise it will not let you. Uh, so we are going to settle right here on this river tile close to a road. The reason we want to settle close to a road is it actually reduces the movement difficulty. Movement difficulty of 0 0.5, if you check over here it's 1, 1, 1. So being on that road basically allows us to move faster when we get caravans, which makes trading more important. And trading is incredibly valuable in this game and helps you save an awful lot of time. So we have picked a place with a year-round growing period that has marble, is on a river, and is close enough to a, a trading location that we're happy. We do not want to settle on tropical rainforest, higher, higher diseases, more trees. We do want to settle in swamps, also more diseases and more annoying to settle on. Of all the locations you can settle, temperate forest is considered the best. The next screen is character selection, and there could be a huge tutorial on this, because it would take an awful long time to cover everything. Now, the most important thing to do is find someone who has good construction. This is going to be the hardest trait to find throughout your entire playthrough, so finding someone who has it is great, and they're incapable of violence. This pawn is completely useless. You do not want to start with a pawn who's incapable of violence. Since none of them have construction, you're going to have to start hitting the randomize button. When it comes to finding someone with a little passion symbol beside their construction, it's actually pretty hard. They're relatively rare. What we're going to do is search through until we find one, or maybe two, and then we're going to put them to the top up there. Going with some very, very rough rules of thumb here, you're going to have three different types of pawn you're going to want to pick. One is cooking plants and animals. This person is what maintains your home. They cook your food, they plant the plants, they tame the animals. Then you've got your trader slash socializer slash recruiter slash intellectual. 
Their job is medical, social, intellectual. They're going to heal everyone up. They're going to recruit new people and do your trading. And they're also going to do your research when they're not busy doing the others. And then finally, you've got your constructor. And what you would like to do is get them with a bit of mining and artistic as well. But honestly, so long as they've got constructing that's all, and they can do uh, basic work, you're good to go. This one here is a hard worker, giving them a massive bonus to global work speed. So if you go down here under general labor speed, they got 120%. That is very nice. That helps an awful lot. If you go down to say someone who has a bad back or something like that because their colonist is too old, you can check under here and you'll see that that has actually reduced their general labor speed to 90%. This is a big negative. If you see anyone with scars or addictions or anything like that, go in here and check under this section to see what their general labor speed. If you're losing 20% of their labor speed, that's really bad. That means they'll plant animals slower, they'll tame things slower, they'll create things slower. You kind of want to have everyone at about 100%. Losing 5 or 6 percentage points might not be the biggest thing in the world, but otherwise, yeah, roll until you get some decent ones for your first playthrough. So to recap, cooking plants and animals on one, medical, social, intellectual on the other, and then construction, mining, and artistic on the last one. Then you want to hit the next button, and it's going to start generating the map. Then you get your flavor text, and you're going to land in the middle of this area. Now we have picked a river, that will become very important later on, but for now this is what you're going to start with. First, schedule. It's not set up optimally, let's change that. This here is known as a biphasic sleeping pattern. It just means they recreate twice and they sleep twice. It makes sure that all of your pawns are well rested at all times in case something nasty happens. And it's one of the preferred methods of doing things and it's this quick, easy way there are optimizations you can do, but this one's just the fastest. Next up, assignments. We want to go in here and change everyone to attack, preferably if they do get attacked. Uh, we're going to want to change drug restrictions as well immediately. You want to get rid of for recreational usage. You don't want them using smoke leaf or beer for recreation. The bottom right picture is ripped directly from the Wikipedia. It shows you what drugs are safe to take without causing immediate addiction. Flake, Yayo, Wake Up, Go Juice, all of those can give you addiction with even a single dose. However, all of these other ones can give you mood bonuses. So we have applied this little schedule here so that if they're ever feeling unhappy, they can go and get these drugs and use them, depending on how low their mood is. Now we select 35% because that is the break point of most pawns. If a pawn goes low, below 35% mood, they have a chance of having a mental break, so they should dose themselves up with something. Smoke leaf is put on the lowest priority because smoke leaf gives a massive penalty to your consciousness. That is bad. Pawns on smoke leaf don't shoot very well. So that's why it's set at 30% to make sure that if anything nasty does happen, they only use it in the absolutely most extreme and dire of circumstances. This is pretty much the default for everyone, though we will be adding uh, numbers in here later. You can get them to keep up to two or three in their inventory at all times. We will up those numbers as and when we get around to drug production or purchase. Next up, food restrictions. First thing we'd like to do is tell them don't eat corpses no matter how desperate you are. That is always bad. Also, plant, raw resources, and all forms of drugs. There's actually nutrition in beer and ambrosia, and you don't want them consuming them if they go ravenous. Then we should probably remove hay and kibble because they're not designed for humans, and I also usually take off chocolate. Chocolate is pretty rare, and you don't want them getting into that. Meat-wise, yeah, no raw meat. We can manually tell them to eat raw meat if, meat if absolutely necessary. And then, yeah, they could eat berries and agave fruit, but yeah, they shouldn't be eating any of the other raw foods unless they desperately need them. Then we can get rid of all of those, and done. So, uh, this allows us to manage what they should realistically be eating, assuming we produce them. That is the basics of assignment done. Now we have to go into work and change this. Immediately set this to manual priorities. Reason being, they do try and make sure that there's someone available to do everything. However, some of your pawns will be missing skills or be bad at skills. For example, Mila here is terrible at tailoring, smithing, and mining. So, no, just she should not be doing any of those. I have done a whole tutorial on how to use this, and it's quite a long one because this is, can get really complicated and granular. Long story short, never set anyone to a priority of one. You want to make sure you always have a one higher number that you can go to so you can do things like, hey, I would like everyone to start cleaning because the place is filthy, or I would like everyone to start hauling because we need stuff to get where it's going. This allows you to raise and lower everyone's priorities using a shift and left or right click. If someone does not have a passion in something, they usually don't get assigned to it. It just takes too long for them to learn anything. If you hover over a trait, it'll tell you they will learn this at 35% normal rate. Someone with just a single flame will learn it at 100%, and someone with a double flame will learn it at 150%. You want everyone to have a flame in whatever they're supposed to be doing. The way it generally works is cook plants animals here will be entirely specialized in these two things. In fact, they'll probably end up specializing in only two. And then you'll uh, hire more and more colonists, and they will spread out all of the load of the work. Having a specialized colonist is usually better than a generalist at the end of the day. Generalists, what they end up doing is hopping from job to job to cover gaps when people die, get injured, or sick. That means they never truly specialize in the one thing they're good at. But yes, definitely keep a few generalists around, but look for specialists more often than not. 
All right, that's the basics of setup before you even start. Then the next thing you're going to want to do is go into orders, right click the allow and unforbid all items. This will unforbid all the items on the map. You see, there's a bunch of other items that are around here. Like there is three survival meals over here. There's another four survival meals somewhere over there. All of these things are scattered around the map and including a bunch of steel and other supplies. So just unforbid the lot. Then you want to pick your best shooter, give them the rifle, your second best shooter, give them the gun, and your best melee person, and give them the knife. Since our doctor is the most valuable pawn, we give them the rifle, we give them, well, we give them the flak vest, and we give them the flak helmet. We don't give anyone the flak pants. They basically have very little protection, and they slow down movement speed by 0.12. It's just not worth it. It's honestly not. You're better off just selling them the moment the opportunity presents itself. All right, well, they're doing that. We want to chop down some trees. We've actually got some wood right here, and this is the normal grid design I use. Simplest way to re think of this is it's 18 down, and it's 17 across. Or the other way to think about it is it's always downhill after 18. So 18 is always downhill after that. Just that's how I remember it's 18 down and 17 across. This gives you a good grid design that's very useful for putting a lot of buildings inside. And if you have analysis paralysis or find it a hard time trying to figure out how to design rooms, pick this size, fit everything inside it. It makes it much easier in the long term. This is going to be our first room slash base. One thing to do, make sure for all of the wall segments where there's trees, just put down a manual chop command. The reason being, otherwise your builder will come along and try and chop them down despite having very low plant skills. Thankfully, our builder actually has decent plant skills, so it's not the worst thing in the world, but uh, yeah, you, yeah, they're going to go, our cook plants animal person is going to go around and harvest these trees. Now, medical social intellectual is a bit of a problem. They don't have any real things they can be doing for us, except... For hauling. So we are going to take all of this stuff and move it inside this room. While it's outdoors, you can see that it's unroofed outdoors and it's degrading at 0 0.25 per day. Uh, once it that, So in four days, it would lose one hit point and X amount of days after that, it will lose all of them and disintegrate. So you like to move things inside that can possibly degrade, especially that medicine. Then you've got stockpile zones. This is what we're going to use to store all this stuff. However, uh, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. This is going to try and store literally everything which can be problematic. For example, steel, wood, some of these things we're not going to want to store inside later on. For now, it's okay, but a good way to think of it is your indoor stockpile should all be set to about normal priority, and then stuff that goes outside and things like that, I usually set them to a higher setting. Build Art Hunt is our only builder. Their construction skill is four, which means they can still botch things and waste resources, but that's fine. They'll get better at it. You can see as they build, their construction is going up. Once they hit 5,000 points, they'll go on to skill level 5 and they'll get faster and faster and faster. One annoying thing that you're going to find your pawns doing is cleaning all the way around your buildings for some reason. And that is all to do with expanding home zone. This little toggle button down here. Turn it off. What it's done is, if you go into zones here, you can see your home zone. It's uh, basically added this entire area and the surrounding parts to your home zone. I don't know why it does this. It should really just add your walls. Everything inside you should probably have to manually add yourself. So you're going to want to learn to manually add areas to your home zone. This means they'll clean it, and if any of the buildings inside it are destroyed, they will be replaced automatically. Let's see. Ah, here we go. Toggle automatically rebuild of destroyed structures in the home area. So your home zone is special in that people inside it will replace the walls and things that are destroyed. Very important. Once construction of the building is complete, they will automatically start to roof it. This doesn't cost anything, and it's just one of those automatic free things you get when you bid it, create a sealed room. You can also manually create and destroy them using the zones tools to build and remove roofs. When it comes to harvesting trees, a good thing to keep an eye on is their growth. If they're at 100% growth, they will be ready to harvest. You will get the most bang for your buck. As in harvesting a tree that's at 78% won't provide as much wood, but will take just as long to chop down. So it's a little bit time consuming, but early on when you have the time, it's a good idea to go through and find trees that are ready to harvest and then chop them manually. There are mods you can get to change that, but I think that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. Almost have beds for everyone now. That means everyone can sleep. We've put them into the corners of the room. Thing is, when people are sleeping, they can get disturbed during their sleep if people walk near them. So putting them in the four corners is just a smart way at the start. You notice that the center of our room is not roofed. That's because you can only have six tiles of roofing off of a wall chunk. Trying to go further than six, the roof can't support it and will collapse. So what we need to do is put something in the center. You can put down a pillar, but a wall tile will do just as good. In fact, wall tiles are usually just faster to build, to be honest, and cheaper. With one day behind us, we put down a table, three stools, so that everyone has somewhere to sit. This is all to do with mood. Currently, the unhappy things they have going on is disturbed sleep. That's because they're sleeping in a barracks and people can stomp in and out, but it's early days. Ate without table, easily fixed with a table and some chairs. Slept on the ground. Well, they were sleeping on these uh, sleeping spots initially, so now that that's gone, they won't have that anymore. Slept in the cold. That can be easily fixed by increasing the temperature by putting a fireplace in here. And finally, they've got awful barracks. This will take a while to change, but we can fix that one as well. 
This is because the quality of the room is awful and it's giving them a negative mood. We need to improve the quality of the room. Next up, though, we do want to get food sorted. So for that, we're going to build ourselves a little kitchenette down here so that we can do cooking. Cooking has the potential for food poisoning, so we want to make sure we minimize the chances. What we need is a butcher's table and an electric stove. We're also going to stick down a standing lamp. In fact, we are going to replace the lamp in here with an electric lamp in a bit. And over here, we're going to put our wood fire generator. This here is going to be a sort of either a field for animals or plants, so we're going to stick in our wood fire generator in here, namely because this is going to give off heat and we don't want to put it in our central area just yet for reasons that will become clear. Multiple forms of recreation are required to keep your pawns happy. One of the most common ones is the hoopstone ring, so we're going to place that right there. Then we'll put down a chess table as well. This will give them two forms of recreation, which is all they'll need for now. When it comes to food production, you want to make sure to minimize the dirt in the room. As you can see, this room has a tendency of very dirty of minus 1.56. The default standard of just regular dirt is minus 1. You want to make sure that the dirt in your kitchen does not go below minus 1. If it goes to minus 1.01, .01, you've got chances for food poisoning going up. So, what we like to do is make sure it's in the home zone. Home zone means your pawns will come along and clean this area. At the same time, what we want to do is put down some flooring. We're going to put down wooden flooring right here. Now, we don't want to floor the whole room. The problem is people walking across floors can drag dirt, but dirt itself is naturally just negative dirt, so you can't drag extra dirt on top of it almost. So, by putting the floor tiles there, people are highly unlikely to walk over these three tiles, dragging dirt onto them, and it drags up the cleanliness of the room. Now we just have to wait until someone comes along and cleans it. We are going to now need, of course, to get our hands on some food. That is where hunting comes in. Before we start the hunting, I want to put down a stone cutting table. We want to start turning these rock chunks into usable bricks. To do that, we're going to make ourselves a quick stockpile zone here. Uh, this stockpile zone, we are going to clear everything and we're going to go down to chunks here. And we're going to allow all the stone chunks for now. They won't move any stone chunks there though, unless they're highlighted. So we are going to grab all of those and move them into that section and build ourselves a wooden stone cutters table. At the same time, we're starting to clear out the trees in this area. We're going to be walling this section in shortly and adding it onto our base. This is an introduction to making bills at tables. This is gets pretty in-depth in some of the later ones, but for now it's fairly simple. We want to make marble blocks, and we want to keep making marble blocks until we have set amount. So we want to do until you have X. So we want to do until we have, say, 200. So once you have 200 marble blocks, you can stop. Uh, what you want you to do is drop them on the floor. We want the worker who's doing it to basically grab the blocks, smash them up, drop them on the ground, and just grab the next chunk and keep going. And what we want to do is reduce the radius. See this radius thing here? That determines how far a worker will go to try and find those chunks to put inside the table. Reasonably small is fine, so that means they'll search inside this radius. What you want to do is try and limit it so that people carry the blocks close to them and then they do the rest of the work. And that's going to be a reoccurring theme with food, blocks, production of just about anything. Day two is ending, day three will be arriving shortly. When it does, that's when our first threat is going to show up. Around day three you'll get attacked by one pawn is the tradition. So far we have been crafting exclusively out of wood. However, that is a fire hazard, which is why we got around to making those marble blocks as soon as possible. Now what we're going to do is start making our outer wall out of marble. This entire outer section will eventually be converted over to marble. The inside will be left as wood for now because, well, it's a lot of effort otherwise. But for now, we want to consume this area here and we can start using this to farm crops. We would like to get a few of them in. We'd also like to store some animals in here as well. A visitor has popped by and this gives us a chance to trade away those flak pants we don't actually want. We can sell them off for actually a reasonable profit. We'll accept the silver. That will go a bit of a way towards getting us our first weapon. Now that this area is almost safe, it's time to do some planting. Over here, we are going to grow some potatoes. Uh, over here, it's rice. This strip is cotton and this strip is heel root. Now, the reason we go, well, I prefer potatoes over rice. Rice is actually slightly more efficient, however it requires more labour. You have to harvest this faster, and it gives, but it gives you less each time. However, potatoes, while only being 93% as efficient as rice, you don't have to harvest them nearly as much, which means it requires less labour. Rice is sort of to get in that emergency early crop so that you've got something to work with. Potatoes is more sustainable, and corn is for the ultra long term. We're not going to plant corn because by the time we see it harvestable, it'll be like really long into the playthrough. So early game, bit of rice, potatoes. Good to go. So for day three, our threat is a mad raccoon. If you just hover over the letter, it will point you in the general direction of the problem. This makes it easier to find. This is very important because honestly, the map is not very well organized. Now we're going to want cook plant animals. Oh, we don't really want to put them tanking. They're our cook. So if they start cooking and they're injured, it increases their likelihood of causing food poisoning. So we're still going to need someone to tank. I'm thinking Lubov, our, uh, our animal over here, has a good chance of being used for that. This is where we're going to use zones. 
we are going to go to manage areas we're going to create a new zone and then we're going to say give us that new zone and put it over oh i'm saying over here should be fine then we're going to crank this door open lock it open we're going to bring everyone back inside so that the animal that's coming to attack us only has one way in to get our animal to go to that zone we created we just go into the animal section and we click on the number tab the tab over here and you'll see that when i hold, hold the mouse over two you can see the areas light up now Lubov should go over there and hold the line. Then we put everyone behind them. And if we desperately need, we can have someone run in to help out. All right, so all the doors are closed. This animal only has one way to attack us. So it will try and come through here. Using our animal as a chump blocker is a time honored tradition. And there we go. As you can see, our accuracy is absolutely horrendous. Been there and getting some stabbing. So turns out the knife killed him. Yep, that's Rimworld for you. However, everyone's shooting skill is pretty terrible right now. It will get better as the game progresses, but for now, we are pretty weak. Now that we have an animal, it's time we made ourselves a fridge. For that, we're just going to put it, place it in here, but we're going to make a stockpile zone for storing those fridged animals. First thing, clear everything, go down to corpses, find animal corpses, select a lot. Maybe don't include insect corpses, you're not likely to need those. Then at the same time, come up here and remove allow rotten. The reason you want to remove allow rotten is you don't want your people going across the map finding dead animals that died out there and dragging them in if they're rotten. You only want fresh corpses. Anyway, that means they'll grab that one. Well, when they get a break, they'll go and grab that one. At the same time, we're going to put down an art bench because we want to turn this place from being an awful barracks into, like, a decent one, if at all possible. When it comes to art, we are back to the middle section again. We want to make large sculptures. Large sculptures are the most cost-efficient ones to make. Grand sculptures, pointless. Small sculptures, pointless in general. We want to come in here, clear everything, and we only want to select marble blocks. This was one of the reasons we settled on this tile. Marble has a beauty bonus to it. None of the other stones are quite as good and nothing else is quite as plentiful. Making it out of gold and jade is possible, but very expensive. You want to drop them on the floor and you want to select the worker. In this case, we want to select build art hunt because they're the only one that's actually any good at art. Then we want to make just one for now. That should mean they should immediately go along and it'll cost them 100 blocks of marble and they will start crafting that. It's going to take them a while. While I would like to let them finish that statue, we do want to refrigerate this animal. We're going to, we could turn it into meals immediately, but I think now is a good time to show in the fridge. You will notice we now have an idle colonist. Medical, social, intellectual doesn't have anything to do, but now they do. We want to find the animals and start stocking up our fridge that we're just about to build. Now, uh, mega slots are bad to hunt. In fact, the best way to figure out how to hunt is to go in here and sort by... The chance this creature will attack when harmed. We don't want to attack anything that might attack back. Not yet. So, said we want to find mares are probably the closest by. These horses down here are the closest thing to our base that I would like. Uh, also, as well as that, when normally when you sort by this method, it also puts the ones with the most meat on them near the top. For example, meat amount, 269. Uh, the donkeys have 157. Alpacas have 112. That's not exactly what you'll get out of them, but that's their potential meat amount. So it's a good idea to go that way. Then, let's go down here and grab ourselves a few of them. Bear in mind, they have zero chance to turn Manhunter. So, we can just get nice point-blank range and start shooting at them. However, they will start running, so it's a good idea to get them on the... Place yourself on the opposite side to your colony, so that they will run towards your colony rather than away. And then you can start shooting. And this also helps because it will up our shooting skill. We're at, what, 2790? And there it gets us 100 points. So... With a horse acquired and a raccoon that's about to spoil in 1.7 days, we want to take this refrigeration unit here. Make sure the red is pointing to the outside area and the blue is pointing to the refrigeration area. Then we want to hit minus 10 and that tells you down here what the target temperature is. We want to take that temperature down, well actually let's just max it out at minus 19. Well, you can go lower than that, but minus 19 is more than sufficient for our needs. This will start dragging down the temperature in this room. It's currently 20C, 17C, 14C. You can turn on this temperature overlay to actually get a better idea of the, the temperature in here. But what you really want to do is get the temperature in here below zero degrees. As you do, the stuff in here starts to take longer and longer to spoil. Once you hit zero degrees, it will no longer spoil. So now we actually have a fridge. And what you want to do is double doors if at all possible. Don't have the doors touching, that actually has the reverse effect. But having a little gap in here does help. Now that we have fresh meat in our freezer, it's time to set up some butcher bills. Now the thing is, you don't want to accidentally, say, end up with a fridge full of raccoons because you chopped up all your horses first. What you want to do is use the smallest animals first and then work your way up to the larger animals. This is sort of useful because fridge space is at a premium. So, what I've done is I've set up three butcher bills. This is my traditional one. And what you do is you put down the smaller animals in the first one, like alpha beavers, arctic foxes, boom rats, chupacabras. Uh, in fact, half of the things in here, I'm kind of not sure if they're quite small, like ducks, Yorkshire terriers, stuff like that. They all end up in this small bill. 
Then you get your medium creatures in here, and this is like just a few extras added in. We're just leaving out bisons, elephants, grizzly bears, rhinos, horses, that type of stuff. Then in the final one, we butcher up everything, trumbles, rhinos, all that stuff. This way we use the smaller things first. Uh, then what you normally do is double down on it so that you end up taking all the small animals as quickly as possible, and then you go to the larger animals when the smaller animals run out. Nothing worse than ending up in the middle of a toxic winter and then finding out that your fridge is full of rat corpses. With the source of the nutrition set up from both plants and animals, it's time to get around to making some simple meals. Simple meals is where we start, and we're going to start on cook simple meal by four. If your cook is not capable of level eight cooking, make it simple meals by one. The thing is, if you have cooking below eight, you have very high chances of getting food poisoning. And if you make four meals, all four of them will have food poisoning. That is crippling. You're much better off cooking the meals individually. That way, while it will take longer, if you do get a poisoned meal, you won't get four all at once taking your entire team out. Having one person down with food poisoning is bad. Two is really bad. And three, that's just a, that's a ticket to death. So anyway, we are going to be cooking four simple meals. Details-wise, we want to do until you have X. We're going to set that to, say, give us 30 meals. Then we want to drop them on the floor, and the only worker who can do it is cook plants animals. Then over here, when it comes to making these meals, all you need is 10 ingredients, either 10 meat, 10 vegetables, doesn't really matter. Done. Then we want to reduce the ingredient range to about there, and finished. Later on we'll be upgrading to fine meals, but this is to wean us off our package survival meals. What we want to do is start using this so that we can save the package survival meals for later. They're great emergency rations because they don't go off and they can be stored anywhere. As you can see, Cook Plants Animal took the raccoon first. Once that's done, they'll go grab the horse. And then after that, they should get around to actually cooking. As you can see, it's slightly dirty in here at minus 0 0.33. Unless this hits minus 1, our chances of food poisoning are absolutely minuscule. One problem we are going to have, though, is when these meals are cooked, they are not showing up in here. See this is 0 of 30? That means the game has not detected that we have already cooked four meals. Simplest thing to do, make yourself a zone, grab a stockpile, and we want to fill this room with it. Then what we want to do is go in here and set this priority to low and then clear all. What this means is this is now a stockpile, but it's not actually set to store anything. Nothing at all. However, we go back in here and unpause the game. You'll see that the four meals are now showing up. So long as we're in a stockpile, even if it's not meant for them, they'll show up. Now we need to enhance this place here so that it can store those same things. So we'll go in here, foods, meals, and we're actually just going to set it to store all of the meals. In fact, let's set a few more things in here. All forms of meat to prevent them from going off. Milk and unfertilized eggs, though we don't have any of those just yet. And the rest can all be left outside. Reason being, vegetables last for about, oh, 20, 15 to 30 days outside. So we don't really care about those. And fridge space is at a premium. Now that we have this actually place sealed in, we are going to break down those walls so we can refuel that from either side. We have uh, Build Art Hunt finishing this area out, and we can finally go into assignments here and we can edit food restrictions. We're going to change people's food restrictions so that they no longer eat packaged survival meals. We don't want them eating that, we want them eating the simple meals because those are more sustainable and we're able to obtain them. Well, we have been filling up the fridge with horse meat. Uh, you will notice that if you click on an animal and check under health, you can see down here that it's going to bleed out in nine hours. In which case, we will set this to hunt, but we're not going to hunt it anymore. We're going to let our pawns back to work. Reason being, once that bleeds out, our pawns will go along and collect its corpse. However, if we don't set it to hunt, when it dies, it will be X'd out. Animals that die of natural causes, as in you don't, you aren't hunting at the time, will automatically be X'd out to stop you from going around and collecting them. We are also going to install a shelf in here. Shelf have unique mechanics in that they can actually store three things at once. Now, we've already set this up to carry our meat, our, our meals, all that stuff. So what we're going to do is just simply copy the settings and we can paste them to the shelf. Uh, that way... The shelf will actually have exactly the same settings, but we're going to put them on preferred, namely because that will mean people will move the stuff off the ground and onto the shelf where it takes up less volume and we can store more in here the more shelves we add. Uh, why don't you just stay in there and prioritize hauling all of that stuff? That looks much more compact and it allows us to store far more in a smaller space. Animals, unfortunately, the, the larger ones can will still take up a whole tile on the ground, but that's fine. You can en We can enlarge this fridge later on as it goes. It's time to start caravanning. For that, we will need to tame some animals to do a decent caravan. So over here, you've got these berry bushes. We are going to harvest them. In fact, let's see, what are you at? You are ready to harvest, we will harvest you also. We're going to harvest all the berry bushes we can to get ourselves some veggies, and we're going to use those to tame animals. Day five, and our first raid has arrived from actual people. And uh, normally it used to be you get it on day three, but it turns out now it's on day five. They are attacking immediately. We we want to hire them. You basically want to hire as many pawns as you can early on, even if they're terrible. You can always fire them later for almost no negatives. So let's uh, grab our people and go outside and greet them. Now, to capture them alive, what we want to do is wound them, but not actually kill them. 
The game does try and make it so that it's very hard for them to die, but if you do shoot at their head or shoot at their torso, they will straight up die. Or you clip them in the heart. Oh, damn it, I think they're going to go around the right side of the rock. And yeah, never mind, we will just wait here for them and we will put our knife person up front. The plan is we want to wound them. If we can wound them, that'll slow them down. Ooh, that was actually a really good shot. Yeah, move speed is 3.86, meaning we could outrun them. However, it'll take them 22 hours to bleed out. We want to shoot them again. Okay, there we go. They'll bleed out in 13 hours. That's sufficient. What's their movement speed? Their movement speed has been reduced to 2.81. What that means is we can take everyone back inside, except for one person, run them around in circles until they bleed out. By running everyone else back inside, we have left them outside to chase after our pawn. Now, they're slowly bleeding out. It'll take them a long time to bleed out, but this way we can keep our pawn running around. Uh, they chase them instead of smashing on the doors. Uh, at the same time, our other pawns in here can still work. We've set up a zone for them. Uh, if you check here, we have area one. We just went under schedule. We assigned them to that area. They'll stay indoors. They won't open any doors. That means the enemy won't come after them. We'll just play Ring Around a Rosie with them for a bit. I did forget to bring back in the wooden butcher's table, so they have smashed that up. That's fine. We can replace it. Uh, they are down to, they have blood loss moderate, eight hours left on them. Usually it's about the four to five hour mark they start to pass out. Never mind, it's the six hour mark. Okay, we've captured our first prisoner. Now it's time to put them somewhere. I normally dump them in the kitchen to start, namely because I don't have any other place to put them just yet, but we can make them a quick prisoner's area. Uh, we will capture them now. You have to set this up to be four prisoners. Don't forget to put everyone back to their normal zones when you're finished. Uh, many a time you find your pawn starving because you forgot to do that. Hey, we'll grab that. In fact, we'll probably take that steel club while we're at it. And luckily they have medical on their hands so they can actually heal them up. All we need to do is stop the bleeding and they should be fine. With the prisoner acquired, it's time to start recruiting them. We're immediately going to stick them on recruit here. We're using this radio button. The resistance is 12, but every so often our social person will come along, talk to them and slowly reduce the resistance until they want to get hired. However, there is always the possibility that they can prison break. You can see it up here, their prison break interval. This is affected by a lot of things. How happy they are and basically how good their mo movement is. So they lower their movement as in, there's their moving is at 40% right now. That means their chances of prison break are much lower. The high, well, As they heal up and get better and better, their prison break interval will drop and drop and drop until it hits, I think, about 60 is where it bottoms out. Just because it says the prison break interval is 60 days doesn't mean they'll wait 60 days every time. They might break after five days, they might break after 120 days, or make their attempt. It just means that the mean interval between breaks will be 60 on average. Next up, it's time to get ourselves some caravan animals. There are several different types. The three main types you will find in this biome are donkeys, alpacas, and horses. Those three are probably your best bet. I prefer to generally go with uh, uh, alpacas out of tradition. Uh, at the same time, they also do provide wool, so it's handy later on for when you want to craft different things. Tame chance failed 51%. That sucks. Okay, so we'll try again, but we want about two alpacas, and that should allow us to carry a decent amount of equipment. The beauty of this room is basically all of those numbers, those minuses, threes, plus a whole bunch of minus sevens and minus elevens, all added together to give us the average beauty, which is, well, terrible. However, what we're going to do here is add a statue which adds 270 beauty. Marble, it's good for that. In fact, we, we got a good statue which was pretty good luck. So with this installed, it'll take our barracks from awful to just slightly awful, less awful. Right, uh, we may have to floor the place a bit to get it up even higher, and we may want to get some of that stuff off the ground. However, all of that costs resources and all of that costs time. But, oh, yet yeah, we're also going to be digging out this entire area. By digging out, I mean removing all the trees. This area is not quite finished yet, and we might be taming an animal soon. So one thing to do is we're going to put down a caravan hitching post. This is normally designed for when you're starting caravans, but if you don't have a place to store your animals, your people will automatically drag them over to the caravan hitching post. 51% chance failed. Three of those in a row. Nicely done, Randy. Actually, it's Cassandra, isn't it? Four in a row. Hmm. By installing three shelves and putting most of the stuff that was on the ground on the shelves, we've managed to get the barracks up to dull. Slightly better than awful. That's five failures. Six failures. We have finally managed to tame a couple of alpacas. I basically spread our net wider so we were targeting more. But two alpacas should be sufficient for now. Now we just need an animal pen for them. I've stuck a fence down here. We're going to use this area to hold them. It keeps them nice and safe when raiders show up. Uh, you get fencing under structures and then you need to come down to a miscellaneous and get pen marker. And this is what basically defines it as a place where you should take animals. You can control a bunch of stuff from there. With that finished, you can then go in here and you can check how many animals, what animals should go in there. By building a second statue, we've managed to bring this barracks up to mediocre. 
Uh, that should mean when everyone goes to sleep tonight, they've got a minus five from dull. That should drop to a minus four or a minus three. It's bringing everyone's mood up just that little bit more. Before we caravan, I should probably point out we got hit by an ambrosia sprout. These will show up and the simplest thing to, and easiest way to manage them is do this. First, surround them in growth zones. There we go. Now that we've got them all selected inside growth zones, what would happen is people would come along and immediately chop them down. That is bad. We don't want them to do that. We only want them to come along and harvest them when they're ripe. So we're just going to double select that and then we're going to say get rid of allow sowing. We don't want them to sow anything here. We just want them to harvest when the time comes. So when these ambrosia plants are ripe, our people will come along and harvest them and we'll get our hands on some ambrosia, which is a nice drug. Then it's time to do a caravan. We're going to travel to our closest trade partner. In fact, we have three trade partners in reasonable range, which has drastically increased our chances of finding what we're looking for. And one of the reasons we held out until we got trade animals is to do with how fast we can move. For example, we're going to get our social pawn and we're going to select them. They can move at 22.1 tiles. It'll take them 0.5 of a day to get where they're going. However, they do need to bring travel supplies with them. So we're going to give them about six meals just in case things go horribly wrong. Actually, four should be sufficient. Yeah, we'll give them four. You move at 21 speed, then we're going to give them all the leather we've got lying around the place, and we're going to give them all the silver, and we're going to give them the steel club, just in case they get attacked along the way and they have to defend themselves. It's good to have both a melee weapon and a ranged weapon. So that puts them at 31 out of 35 kgs. However, it's still down to 15 tiles a day, so it's going to take 0.6 of a day to move them. However, throw in a couple of pack animals, and we've dropped that down to 0.4 of a day. Allows them to move faster. They're going to collect everything up and head on their way. You can actually go in here... Make sure that their food is good, their sleep is good, and their recreation is good before you send them off. Otherwise, it could get problematic if they have any mental breaks along the way. Once they've collected everything, they'll start heading towards the edge of the map. Now, you may have instances where the pawn is having problems where the animals are dragging them back. Draft them, undraft them, and the animals will disconnect, and they'll actually follow them to the edge of the map automatically. That whole rope to them thing is just graphical. You don't have to worry about it when you're leaving. When you're coming back, that's a different story. But when you're leaving, the animals will automatically make their way to the edge of the map. Done. Now, if we check on the world map, you'll see that we have 0.3 of a day to get to the destination. Once they're there, we can do trading. Trading is vitally important to your early game survival. If you're not using trading, you're handicapping yourself. Up here, you can see you've never visited here. You can see that the stock is unknown and it'll tell you what they're capable of buying. All the, all the locations are the same, pretty much. Now, once we get here, you have two options. One is the save scumming option. You can try trading there. And if your trading doesn't show you what you want, you can always just reload the game and open it again. It only actually generates the inventory when you hit the trade button here. So once we hit this, all of this is locked in. However, if we had saved it beforehand, you can basically save scum to get stuff. I wouldn't advise it. It's more fun to actually try and uh, survive with what you get given. All right, there is an LMG. It's not a great weapon. Of the four main primary weapons you're looking at, you would be looking at actually five, sorry. There's a, the charge rifle is probably the best of the lot. However, very expensive and you're not gonna be able to afford them early on. Mini guns probably come in second and they're even more expensive. Then third, you're looking at about the heavy SMG, then comes the assault rifle, and then comes the LMG. The assault rifle would be better than the SMG, but only once your shooting gets up to about 12-ish, or maybe higher than that. However, we're going to want to buy the LMG. That will drastically increase our firepower. If we could afford that smoke launcher, it would actually be great. By selling off the leathers we brought with us, we were able to afford the smoke launcher. So, we now have an LMG and a smoke launcher to bring back us, and we know there's a charge rifle here if we can, mus uh, if we can muster up 1300. Once the caravan arrives back, they can arrive from randomly any direction. In fact, when it comes to sending caravans out, you can send a caravan to go down here and they might leave from the top of the map or the left of the map or the right. It's completely random. And when they return from the bottom right, they might not actually come in on the bottom right of the map. In this time they did, they might come in from the top left or the top. It's completely random. It's very important to know that because if there's enemies on the map, you have to be very careful about bringing pawns onto it. Unless you can be certain that they're going to be able to get back to base if they end up anywhere on it, because they might end up over here and there might be a whole bunch of enemies there who will immediately kill them. Our rice crop is starting to come in. That means it's time to make a few changes on the meal bills. When it comes down to meals, simple meals are the most basic ones and they give no pluses or minuses. Fine meals are one step up. They give a plus five mood bonus. And all they require is that you use a 50-50 mix of meat and vegetables. Simple meals can be made from either meat or vegetables, but if you combine a 50-50 mix, you get bonuses. We're going to do the same thing as we did with simple meals. It's just going to be 30 of them, pause when satisfied, and they can basically have access to everything. By default, it will not include insect meat or human meat. So you don't have to worry about accidentally giving your people stuff that will make them unhappy. Drop on floor and make sure it's our dedicated cook. You don't want anyone else doing this. At the same time, we want to reduce the amount of simple meals we're cooking because we're not going to be using those anymore. 
We want to be running exclusively on fine meals. We will keep a small stockpile of simple meals just in case something goes wrong. Your pawns will automatically try and break the resistance of the prisoners. However, make sure the person doing it has the highest social possible, and you make sure it's them by setting them to wardening. After wardening, they're set to manage, feed, chat, and recruit the prisoners. Don't use, if you have multiple people with good social, make sure to use the one with the best. That will allow you to do it the fastest. The new meals will change everyone's mood to a plus five. There we go, eight fine meal, plus five, lasts for an entire day. Up until this point, we have been just trying to get the basics down. Survival, getting a new recruit in, the usual. However, now we need to start planning for the potential things that could kill us. One thing that could have hit us by now already and would have been absolutely crippling is a cold snap. Cold snaps will reduce the temperature on your tile by, oh, by 20 or 30 degrees. And what happens is it can put the temperatures below minus 10, which means all your crops will die out and all the animals will flee the map leaving you with no real source of food. So because that is the most likely thing to really hurt us right now, we are going to clear the map. We have all three of our people equipped. We've got our new LMG equipped on our best shooting pawn. Yeah, they've got a shooting of three, but that will go up shortly. Everyone else is, yeah, they're all pretty low. But we're going to go after Boomlops, namely because it's raining, and I think we can risk shooting them now. Now, they might all go Manhunter. If they do, that will be a problem. Ooh, excellent, there is one of them. Now, you'll notice that one was x deck when we first clicked on it. The reason for that was, well... We hadn't actually set it to hunt. Uh, anyone want to shoot that thing? There we go. Two down. Now, the reason we do this in the rain is, well, these things are explosive, and if you don't do it in the rain, all of their corpses will get eaten up by the fire. Come on, last one. Uh, yes, now that is a trick. You see, it's not actually dead. It's still alive, just we've shot it. So we're going to get a little bit closer and do some more shooting. Uh, one thing, shooting animals that are downed does not give you experience. So these are the only animals I shoot from a distance. Everything else you just walk up and either melee it down or... Yeah, there we go. Now, we can immediately bring those back and then I'm going to clear the map. We're going to grab as many animals as we can. Well, all the larger ones. So, mega slots, muffalo. Actually, we might tame a donkey. Alpacas. Anything on the map that we would like that has a decent amount of meat on it, we're going to throw it in the fridge so that we've got a nice food supply. Do be aware that mega slots are pretty tough, so and they will go manhunter on you, so do give yourself a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to hunting them. I hunt them from max range, and when they do go manhunter, you should be able to get off enough shots to slow them down so much that they can't catch up with you. They are hella tough. They take a lot of damage to go down. Light is a relatively common event that can strike and it will destroy a crop. Everything in here is basically lost. However, it will only strike one crop at a time at first. For example, if it hit the rice, it wouldn't affect any of the cotton and vice versa. However, it will immediately start to spread, so you need to cut all the blight. Another thing you should probably do is get rid of allow sowing. You don't want your pawns trying to plant anything else while there's still blight to be removed. And then another thing to do is maybe go into everyone's assignments and make sure that they do this as quickly as possible if you have multiple ones. We don't, we really only have one pawn that does it, but for now, I think we're going to max everyone out. We need this taken care of quickly, or it's going to spread and cause issues. There we go, quickly and efficiently dealt with. Do not put one of those on the long finger. If you do, it will eat all of your crops alive. You can't hunt animals automatically. All you have to do is just basically click on this button here, and you can mark animals for hunting. This is a nice way to get stuff done, but early on, you want to get as many as you can, and we're getting raided again. Okay, there was a few minor issues going on here, but this raid is going to be over here, and this one's going to be much more serious. We have three people showing up. They are all close combat related, but thankfully our shooting skill has gone from zero to two, two to four, and I think they started on two, and now they're at five. So we've been gradually improving our skill. This is the whole reason we went shopping, bought more guns, and went around and killed all these animals. This, one, provides us with food, and two, trains up the shooting skill of everyone so they're not terrible at it. Early on, you're going to be concentrating on getting people's good skills, like, oh, construction, we got that from four to eight, or their medical, or their food, or their animals, or their plants. But what's really important is making sure you don't die when the enemies show up. Now, this crowd here, they're going to show up, and if our doors were all locked, as in they could have no way of getting at our people because they were safely inside the building, they would start smashing on the walls randomly. they just pick a wall outside and start smashing it. We have left our door open. They have a clean path into our base, which means they will come here directly. Since they are all three melee people, this is very common early on when you have low wealth, they are going to come charging right for us and go straight for this door. We're going to stay outside for a bit, shoot at them, and then when they get too close, we're going to fall back, use our dog as a chump blocker, and then shoot them down in the corridor. 
if we could capture some of them alive, that would be great, but because there's so many of them, that's almost impossible. Oh, anyway, if you click on this, it will tell you what's going on, as in they are going to prepare for a while and then attack. We get to prepare defenses. So we actually have a little bit of time before they show up. I'm going to let everyone keep sleeping. While we're waiting for the enemies to show up, a very important thing about butcher's tables. Butcher's tables are naturally dirty, as in it has a cleanliness of minus 15. As far as I'm aware, this is the only building that has this attached to it. What that means is if you install it in any room, it drives up the dirtiness of the room. Doesn't matter if it's a brand new building and has never actually touched meat. So for example, the dirt in this room is minus 1.05. And when we install that, it jumps from minus 1.05 to minus 1.13. This is actually causing dirt in the room. That is why you normally separate your butcher's table from your electric stove. You don't want the two of them in the same room because this causes the room to be dirty and having dirt in the room where you're cooking causes food poisoning. Peza has joined us. They're our newest colonists and as such we can rename them. We now just have to integrate them into the workflow. What you normally want to do is pick one or two traits and get them to take over that exclusively. I would think mining and construction would be their best bet. Mining because we do not have a miner yet and construction because, well, they've got a burning passion out. They are lazy, which reduces their global work speed by 20%. This is bad. However, we don't care because they can hold a gun and they can shoot stuff. In this game, hiring more colonists is generally better. Unless the colonist is going to cause a negative to you, you're better off having more colonists, more guns. The more firepower you've got, the better off you are. Now, raids scale with wealth and the amount of colonists you have. However, the simple math of it is this. The amount of cooking facilities and bedrooms and all that it takes to maintain a colony is barely touched when you add on an extra pawn. So, for example, one colonist could cook for about 15, and that means you can have 15 colonists for one kitchen. If you upgrade to two kitchens, then you can support about 30 colonists, which means more people gives more firepower while increasing your wealth by less every colonist you add. Getting up to 15 colonists is good, 20 is probably about the point where you'll start breaking the game in terms of the amount of firepower at your disposal. Right now, our biggest concern is they do not have any clothing, and our second concern is none of them have crafting. We have no one who's any good at crafting, our best is cook plant animals with a three. Everyone else either can't do it or has a zero and we need to make them some clothes and keep an eye out for someone we could recruit who has crafting. So you want to go under production, find a crafting spot, and we're going to go with the most basic clothing possible, which is tribal wear. And what you want to do is go in here and we want to decide what to make it out of. Checking in our make tribal wear, you see it requires 60 fabric or leather to make. We can go into leathers and we can see exactly how much of each type we have. We will select camel hide. Do specify because some stuff is better than others. Heavy fur is more resistant to sharp objects. This is actually good for making your armors out of preferably your dusters. Then we'll just drop that on the floor and instead of any worker, we'll select cook plants crafting and we're going to have to make sure that they do this immediately because we would like to get them from not being naked anymore. Reason being, naked gives them a minus six and it also makes them chilly, which is minus four. Low crafting skill will mean this is going to be horrible quality, more than li li likely. Oh, and the tribes people from the Alliance are attacking. You get this notification up here when they're ready to attack you. So, Muppet, I would like you to forswear. Oh, normal, that's highly improbable. This is its sharp protection. As you can see, it's pathetically small. Uh, you need to have sharp protection of about 80, 70 to 80-ish before things start getting really noticeable. However, it does increase cold and heat resistance. Now, one thing to note about this is humans have a comfortable range. 16 degrees to 26 degrees. If you go above 26 degrees, they're going to get slept in the heat. If they go below 16 degrees, they get slept in the cold. You want to keep the temperature in your place below those to keep everyone happy. However, that requires a lot of temperature management and is usually not worth it early on. Clothing does not change this. Clothing just means that they can survive without getting hypothermia or overheating by increasing these temperatures, but it does not change their slept debuffs. Anyway, we are going to get Muppet to equip a tribal wear, then we're going to get them to pick up a plasteel knife, and then we're going to start up on killing these enemies. The fight is about to kick off, the enemies are about to come in range. What we're going to do is line up all the people here, keep shooting at these until they start to get too close. When they do, we will fall back to behind here. And where is Doggo? Uh, Lubov is coming along and they're going to hold the door along with Muppet. So, try and do as much damage as we can. If any of them go down and get knocked unconscious or become disabled, we will totally capture them if at all possible. And there we go. So that's that problem solved. Now, both of these are dead, which is bad, but we're still going to keep shooting at this one. If we can manage to down them, oh, chemical damage and a psychite addiction. Never mind. It was hopeful that we could capture another colonist early on. When you have low colonist numbers, the storyteller tries to give you more, so they're more likely when you shoot people to down them. There are lots of myths about using different weapons to be more likely to capture people. If you go into the storyteller settings, you can modify them mid-game, you can change everything, and this is what we're currently playing on in terms of difficulty, and this is all the sliders that get changed. Down here you'll see enemy death on downed, 100%. This is the chance that colonists go down, or enemies go down, when you shoot them. 
However, there's a few things affecting this. If you shoot them with a really big gun that does 40 points of damage and completely takes their head off, then they're definitely 100% going to die. However, you will see lots of instances of pawns dying to getting hit on the arm or hit in the leg, stuff that should not have killed them, but they'll still go down and die. This is to do with this number. This is why using different weapons has almost no bearing on downing enemies. Using lower damage weapons will increase your chances ever so slightly, but honestly, it's very small. So long as you're not using a big weapon that's going to just take their head or their torso clean off, they just have a percentage chance of going down on average. So don't sweat about what weapons you're using. If you have prisoners and you want to down them, though, that's a different story. You should probably use the least damaging things you possibly can, preferably your fists or the butts of weapons. Disposing of the corpses is actually a bit of an inconvenience. People don't like the sight of dead bodies. However, first what we'll do is we'll make a zone over here in the water. The reason we want to make it in water is water increases the decay rate. For example, this pawn here is decaying at one point a day. It'll take them 100 days to decay fully. If we put them in water, that jumps up to four, which means in 25 days the entire corpse will be gone. Grenades, Molotovs, stuff like that would help, but we don't have access to them just yet. However, we only want one pawn doing it. We only want Build Art Hunt to be doing it because they're a psychopath and they don't care about the sight of dead bodies. More on that in a bit. So what we're going to do is create another zone. We're going to call this only corpses and what you want to do is this go to expand allowed area go only corpses and we want to make this corpse stockpile there then we'll do a minor change by inverting it by hitting invert the zone includes everything but that section so if we go to only corpses you'll see everywhere but that stockpile zone is included into it then we just select everyone to only be in that zone, except for our psychopath. Now, they are not prioritized on hauling, so I've manually told them to go around and haul of them all over there. And once they're done, we'll show you why we're only assigning them to this particular task. While they are busy doing that, we're going to get Muppet and give them an additional task. You see, Muppet can do cooking. Losing your cook can be quite hurtful, especially considering the five mood bonus it's giving you and the fact that, well, everyone's not going to be super happy at this stage of the game. So we want to make sure that Muppet can take over cooking if needs be. However, if they cooked now, they'd cause a lot of food poisoning. So instead, we're going to assign them exclusively to butchering. So all of these butcher bills in here, we're going to make sure only Muppet can do it. With all of them changed, that means Muppet will be able to get some cooking experience by butchering. Uh, when it comes to the actual cooking itself, that's still restricted to cook plants animals to make sure that we don't get any food poisoning. Slowly but surely, Muppet will develop skills at cooking and eventually they will, if necessary, be able to fill in in the cooking role if cook plants animals dies, gets sick or gets injured in some way. Everyone is currently throwing a party. These appear to be more likely to happen when your mood is low or negative events have hit you recently that have driven down everyone's mood. This will give everyone a little bit of a mood boost. Uh, you could... Muppet, just join in for the love of God, you're new. With that problem solved, we're going to clear out the rest of the map of animals. We want as many as possible. We're about to do some mass trading again. To fund our next caravan trip, we are going to chop, chop up a whole bunch of animals. This will give us furs, leathers, and meat. For this next caravan, I thought I'd point out the importance of donkeys and horses. They actually have caravan riding speed built into them. It's this little horse symbol. Alpacas don't get it. Donkeys and horses do. And if we tick this button here, you can check our route travel time goes from 0 0.7 to 0 0.6 as well as that it takes our movement speed from 21.2 tiles to 30 tiles. It's like a 50% increase in movement speed. It's not quite always that drastic, but keeping a couple of donkeys or a couple of horses around long term is always a good call, especially when you're going to be doing a lot of trading. Now, we're taking a bunch of food with us and we're going to head down here and see what they've got to trade. If you check on show what they'll buy, it'll tell you their next restock in this place is 24.7 days. So going back here will just net us the same things. That is why we tried to settle in a nice central location where we can hit up several. One thing I forgot to mention, any pawns that see corpses, they get a negative to their mood. And if the corpses are rotten, they get an extra negative on top of that. That's why Build Art Hunt is the one set up to do it. They're a psychopath. They don't care about the sight of corpses. However, psychopaths are still affected by rotten corpses, so your best bet for dealing with corpses later on, later on in the game is finding someone who has bloodlust. Bloodlust people are not bothered by either. Otherwise, you're going to end up with people getting a lot of negative mood lit debuffs from having seen corpses. And we've got attacked again, which is quite frequent. It's day 14, and this is our third human attack? All right, and we've got another problem. And this is sort of a demonstration of how they will mess you up. We were out here hunting animals and our pawn here is just on the, uh, is inside already the attack radius of one of the enemies. We need to get out of here. In fact, we need to bring everyone back home immediately and hopefully no one dies, but I'm not holding it any hope on that one. Like I said, doesn't matter if you play it right, you get caught at the edge of the map. I mean, this could have been worse. They could have been right here and get surrounded and then they're just straight up dead. That has happened and will happen to you. So the standard policy applies. Run, 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 run away. Run away, and hopefully they don't shoot you. If they land a shot on us that slows us down, we're probably dead. Uh, movement speed 4.51. Okay, we're still moving. Thankfully, it's raining, which actually decreases their accuracy, which means we may be able to get back to base in time. What route are you going to take? That? 
actually works. You were hit in the right shoulder. Okay, no immediate danger. Perfect. We can get you back home and hopefully get you some safety. Now, problem is all of these enemies are ranged. This is the second type of problem you're going to face. What we're going to do is uh, the normal thing of we're going to wait around the corner, wait until they put their head around the corner, and then put bullets into their head. Here comes their pawn. Now, we're just going to sit in here for a second and maybe get a few shots off. When you hide behind cover, as in a wall, your people can poke around and get shots off. So you should be able to see this pawn yet yeah, also get some shots off. And then what we're going to do is wait until they start shooting back, and then we're going to take cover some more. Yeah, go here. Perfect. Now, this has split them up. Some of them have stopped here to start taking pot shots, but others are trying to close in closer to get shots off. Oh. Problem. We'll just hide around the corner here. Damn it, I don't want all three of them at the same time. Are all of you going to attack simultaneously? Yeah, that's a problem. Alright, so. You are the most expendable. Lubov, you have training, you can attack, so what we will do is let Lubov off the leash. All you have to do to let them off the leash is find out who's actually attached to them. So, to unleash Lubov, what we need to do is go under animals, and under here you'll see these two little tick boxes. Follow Master while Master is drafted, and follow Master while Master is doing field work. We just want them to follow Master while Master is drafted. We're gonna have to turn that off again later. This list, this will bring up this option, animals attack. This way we're ordering Lubov to go in and start attacking people. We need to do this because we don't want to buy ourselves some time. The third, the fourth pawn is out there, but we were hoping to split them up a bit more. It didn't work quite as well as we were hoping. Oh, that's one down. That is two down shortly. Seriously? Okay, two down. Uh, you can come forward and you can come forward. And, yep, it's actually the melee that's doing most of the damage. Good job, Lubov. All right, that's three enemies down and one left. You do want to try and chase and kill the last one. After you've done all your chasing and hunting and, well, capturing everyone, what you want to do then is make sure your animal is not assigned to follow a drafted pawn anymore. Otherwise, that gets real confusing. You're only going to want to turn that on when you want to release them for attack. And then we can get back to uh, releasing our caravan as well. When it comes to tending injury, the thing that really counts is the tend quality. Best bet, tend that wound as best you can. See that 76%? That determines how quickly that injury is going to heal. If you heal people in the field, they're less likely to get a good 10. The 10 quality will be lower and it'll take them longer to recover from the injury. You only get one shot at a 10. So preferably bring them back to a bed in a clean room. We have not invested in floors. Floors at this point are almost pointless because we'll be dragging so much dirt across them, we'll be spending more time cleaning them than actually getting a benefit from them. Usually you start investing in floors around the point where you've got about 8, 10, eight to 12 colonists. Before that, it's usually not worth the effort. Our caravan is on the road, literally. It's going to take it 0.2 days to get to its destination because of the combination of roads with no mountains or anything in the way and the fact that we've got a caravan animal in there that's increasing movement speed. This is very important. This is why it's really nice to settle in your roads. Also, you will note that Muppet here has a minus seven mood from observing three corpses. This is because they're not a psychopath and don't have bloodlust either. If you don't have a psychopath, pick someone who's got some sort of mood boost, iron willed, anything like that. Something that will help them resist the, the negative effects because dealing with corpses is a long term problem. This bit here is the core of the tutorial. By focusing ourselves on buying weapons, upgrading our shooting skill, hunting animals, we're making ourselves more resilient to attacks because we're better at shooting. We can scrap up a bunch of these animals for meat. This meat will go off in about three days, so what we do is we chop up a bunch of animals, we take the meat, we take all the hides, we go to the local trading location, and that gives us 965 silver. This is a cheap and efficient way to get silver early on while simultaneously training your people up. And if you have a crafter on your team, you can then craft these things into clothing to enhance their value even more while training up your crafter at the same time. And this gives us options to a few things. For example, even selling these weapons, like the steel knife and the uh, spear we brought with us are worth, like, what, 15 bucks? That's nothing. The meat and hides are what are giving us all of our money. Now, the one thing I would like to get my hands on is well, a shock lance would be absolutely amazing. A heavy SMG would have been preferable, but that's unfortunate. And, oh, wow, they do also have grenades, which we would like to come back for. A flak vest would also be something that would be on our radar. But this shock lance will allow us to knock two pulley people unconscious, which means we can recruit two more people. This is very important early on. The more people you have, the more likely you are to survive. So we're going to take that shock lance and head right back home. Then we're going to hunt more animals and we're going to get more meat and more hides. And then we're going to go to this location and see what they have to trade. Uh, they will be our three main trading partners. However, that's enough of that. For now, we need to get into one last thing, and that is research. That is the one thing we have been neglecting. 
Now, we are about 15 days in, and we only have 45 days till the end of the year. There's a whole bunch of milestones we have to hit by then. One of the things you do have to worry about, though, is getting your caravan ambushed. This is one of the reasons most people don't do caravans early on. They're worried about their, their home base getting attacked when they're away, or the caravan itself getting attacked. Both instances are not too much of a worry. In this instance, we've got two snow hares that are... Uh, going to attack us, and our pawn is over here. If at all possible, you would like to get into some sort of corner like in here so you can minimize your surface area, preferably one where you're surrounded on three sides, but that's not always possible. Uh, your best bet, though, is always, always bring a melee weapon with you. Uh, we do have a shock lance, but here it is, a steel club. So we're going to drop the steel club on the ground. I always try and bring one melee weapon around this, and then what we do is we just stand on top of it. This way, if the rabbits get in too close, we have the option to switch to a melee weapon. And... Can we hit one of them? Just one. Just one. No, we cannot. Whip steel club. And there you go. Done. Problem solved. When you have low wealth, the caravan raids will be very small. At worst case, this would be one pawn attacking us. We could hide behind some rocks, or if their melee was very weak, we could run them down. It is very unlikely you're going to lose a caravan. And if your home colony is attacked, your wealth is taken to, into account. We used to have three pawns, and we've got them armed. If, we, if our medical pawn was not here, the attack that last hit us would be missing at least one person, which means we'd only need to take down two people and we still got Lubov to help tank. They're a good dog. Right now, with the skills, weapons, and that shock lance we've got at our disposal, there's almost no event that Cassandra could throw at us that would kill our Connolly that I'm aware of. However, in once we hit the 60-day mark, it unlocks a bunch of other things, namely toxic fallout, volcanic winters. Uh, there's also other attacks that can get us as we get bigger, like mortar raids, things like that. So we need to start knocking out research and we need to start knocking it out fast from this point onwards. Right now, it's just been survival mode and getting a good stable base, but we're going to need to get our hands on solar panels, batteries, mortars, flak armor, gas operation. There's a whole bunch of things in here that we're going to need. And for late game, we're going to need deep drills, ground penetrating scanner, long range mineral scanner. All of these things have a purpose and they help you survive other events that can happen later on. This is not the only way to survive the first 15 days in RimWorld. You can go the nutrient paste route. Nutrient paste meals have zero chance of food poisoning and don't require you to actually have a cook. However, they give you minus three mood. That's a bit of a harsh negative and on the harder difficulties that's harder to maintain everyone's mood especially when you start getting hit, hit by psychic drones and things like that. I prefer this method as it leads you naturally towards animals, it leads you naturally towards hunting which increases everyone's skill and it also leads you naturally towards trading to buy more weapons and armor which allows you to bypass a bunch of the early research and instead focus on survival at the very beginning which is most important on the higher difficulty levels. I've included the save game file from the start and the end, they're linked in the description if you want to have a look at them. I hope this was at least mildly informative for you and uh, good luck! <laughs>